Um, that racial justice reckoning, I think, is just one of these uh, series of earth-shaking events that we've seen in 2020, any one of which would have been the story of the year in a normal year, uh, COVID-19 and the deaths of more than a quarter of a million people and rising, um, the resultant economic freeze and the clear perils ahead and unemployment and structural economic change, climate change and the enormous deathly weather events that it has unleashed, uh, one of the most contentious elections in our history and a president who so far has accepted uh, to accept I'm sorry, so far has refused to accept its results. Um, each of these obviously has affected life in the nation's newsrooms. Taken collectively, they're changing things profoundly, I think in some ways for the better, in some ways uh, perhaps not, and that's what we're going to be talking about. Um, so, Sewell, let's, let's start with you. The, the changes in your newsroom have played out very publicly this year. Um, particularly around a racial and ethnic representation. Will you, will you talk about what's happened there, how it evolved, and particularly what happened in the wake of the George Floyd killing? Yeah, as in so many newsrooms, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about representation and equity. I think the discussion in Los Angeles is particularly, um, I would call it advanced. Um, this is a more, uh, it is a more diverse region of the country than any I've lived in. LA is a city that's 47% Latino um, uh, in a state where uh, non-Hispanic whites became a plurality of the population in 2015. I think only Hawaii shares that distinction. So in many ways, you know, when it comes to um, uh, the waves of demographic change happening, you know, California is at the forefront. Um, we've had a lot going on in the newsroom. I'd say some of the most important um, uh, developments have been the organization of Latino and Black caucuses within the Los Angeles Times Guild, which is itself uh, pretty new. It organized two years ago, two, two plus years ago, and is the first uh, newsroom union in Los Angeles in 138 years. And our journalists of color rightly asked about uh, what are we doing to improve diversity? What are we doing to improve career pipelines? So after, in the wake of the George Floyd killing, um, and in, I've only been at the LA Times two plus years, but I'd heard so many stories about really painful lapses in coverage, journalistic failures in the past. And I proposed doing something fairly ambitious, which is to publish um, an, a, a big editorial. Um, uh, and, and that came together with other, uh, examining our history. And then, uh, so let me discuss that editorial first. It was called Our Reckoning. It was part of a package called Our Reckoning with Racism. And, you know, in, in about 3,500 words, the editorial really focused on how the LA Times was really grounded in white supremacy. And we were not, um, we were not ashamed to call that out. I mean, we wanted to call that out explicitly and to say, you know, this LA Times is a uniquely kind of fascinating history. The original owners were really, um, not only stood for kind of commercial and industrial interests, but really helped build LA. And we, we combined that editorial really looking very, very um, critically at our history with testimonials from journalists of color and also a formal public apology, both in the editorial and from our publisher. And uh, it's been really well received. Um, we also recognize, however, that it's just one step um, in, a, in a really a long process that's, that, that needs to happen urgently. Um, Marsha, Vice began with, uh, at least in my opinion, sort of a bad boy, iconoclastic, non-PC, white guy kind of ethos. Um, now you uh, and your team are, are trying to do things that, that position the company as a voice for and of a generation across race and gender and, and class lines. So talk about w what some of those activities are and, and how it's how it's working both internally and how do you think it's being perceived externally? Hi, thanks very much for the question, David. Lovely to, to be on the panel. Um, hi, Sewell. Um, I think that um, we are still trying to shed the bad boy uh, image uh, in certain arenas uh, because it was profound. Um, while we were doing great work, most people don't realize uh, the the company has been around for 25 years, but it started as a kind of punk rock counterculture skateboard magazine on the streets of Montreal um, and grew and grew and grew and grew. And what happens when you have that kind of cataclysmic unbridled growth, things kind of get unwieldy. Uh, so we've retrenched, we've pulled back, we've uh, 
uh, got a, a new female CEO who takes no prisoners. Um, and she's brought in a, a new cadre of women uh, and women of color. Um, and for instance, our newsroom, uh, all of the senior uh, executives are women. Uh, we are led by a gentleman who's the president of the news division, Jesse Angelo, um, but uh, all of the senior execs are women and they are brown and black. So I think that that was a huge statement on our part to um, rectify some of the issues. We did pay parity studies. Uh, we really looked at our DE&I track record, which was not great, and we're chipping away at that. Um, so I think it's a challenge, but we took it head on because before the reckoning of this summer, we had our own Me Too reckoning. So we, it's just been one reckoning after another, but you know, we want to get this right. So um, I think the work that we've done over the last two years has been important. And I think that work is also exemplified in our content. So we really do cover stories that the other guys don't. And I so, think- So give us some examples of those. Um, so when the reckoning came down this week, uh, this, this past summer, uh, the newsroom, like Sewell's, was um, angry. And they called all of us out uh, of our safe virtual cubicles to talk about what we were gonna do as a company. So one of the first things that we did was we said that we would dedicate uh, a significant amount of our content to helping our audience understand systemic racism. So we have a continuing project that I'll try and remember to put into the chat. If not, uh, I'll figure it out later, um, called the 846 Project, which is uh, at that time was the length uh, it took George Floyd to die. And what it is is across all of the Vice Media Group, journalists can pitch the stories that they want people to understand around systemic racism, whether it be in health, whether it be in education, it's just literally let us flood the zone in one area of our pretty significant company, but allow everyone to contribute and pitch. And for me, that was, that's not a one-off. That is something that we're gonna continue to do. It's in, a, uh, it's showcased on our digital platform in terms of text pieces, video pieces, social pieces, pieces on Vice News Tonight. There is a commitment for us to continue to do this because we are so far away from the general populace understanding of what's happened or in our country over the last 400 years. This isn't a surprise. It's just that we weren't listened to. And I think that one of we, meaning myself as a woman of color, as a black woman, um, have always said that there were issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion in newsrooms. So when you have someone like me at the table that now finally can be heard, uh, I think there is significant change. And there were no black women uh, in senior management advice before I arrived. So, so at, at, at the LA Times, I mean, certainly the, the leadership is, is still in place, although positioned for transition. Um, you know, at, are you, and, and it, with your leadership, we're, we're obviously seeing some profound things happen in the opinion pages, but are you seeing the same sort of evolution of the news coverage and, and what, what is happening? And I don't want to put you in too awkward a position here, but what is happening in terms of the leadership structure and representation at the newspaper? Well, you know, we, we really ha were an institution that had been decimated uh, by cuts and turmoil, like at least one entire kind of um, masthead had kind of been left the institution on mass for various reasons. So again, as you say, you know, Norm was really trying to rebuild this institution. I'm very proud to report that our masthead is more than one third. Um, uh, it's about 40% people of color. Uh, it's half female. Um, we're obviously one of the most, uh, probably the largest legacy newspaper owned by a person of color. 
uh, and who grew up in apartheid South Africa and who has really made um, you know, a commitment to diversity and inclusion really central to his vision for the Los Angeles Times. So I think we're, we're, we're making steps forward, but you know, it, it, we have to, it's been very bracing to reread the Kerner Commission report to look at you know, generations of efforts at diversity. And I do, I'm not of the school that says that you know, nothing has changed but certainly one can say not nearly enough has changed. And, um, um, and you know, I'm existing in that middling space. I mean, I've been part of diversity. Uh, it, you know, I've benefited from diversity initiatives. Full disclosure, I was an Art Peters copy editing intern at the Philadelphia Inquirer in 1995, uh, pro part of a program designed to bring journals of color into newsrooms. And, you know, I, I believe in this mission, uh, but it's very, very clear that you know, we can't wait another, you know, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, as, as was discussed earlier, but very eloquently, I thought by Tom Rosenstiel, like we can't, um, yeah, you know, uh, aging white liberal audiences are really important. I, it's a community I feel very close with, but they alone cannot sustain mainstream journalism. We're facing so much pressure right now from, from really all sides of the political spectrum. I'll just give you one example from uh, today, in fact. Uh, we devoted um, our letters page today just to letters from Trump supporters in Southern California. And, you know, this comes after four years of condemning Trump. We called for his conviction and removal. We had two editorial board projects about Trump's dishonesty and mendacity and how to defeat him. We endorsed Biden. And yet I'm facing so much uh, anger right now on Twitter from people who, who are asking, you know, how dare you platform, uh, uh, you know, uh, Trump supporters. And, and it, it's a very, very hard time. I mean, you know, there's still about 30% of voters in Southern California. Uh, I choose to believe that not every last one of them is racist. Some of them are people of color, but it's a very, very hard time. You know, the main street, the center is not holding right now the way it used to. And maybe that's a good thing. Um, we have a question uh, here from Sabrina asking about the representation of, of, of Latinx uh, leadership uh, in, in these. In she, she refers to the three organizations you're part of. I'm assuming in, in my case, she's um, perhaps referring to uh, maybe the Lenfest Institute and, and the Philadelphia Inquirer rather than Temple. Um, I, and you may have seen um, the Philadelphia Inquirer just uh, this week, uh, yesterday, the day before, I believe, announced um, the ascension uh, of Gabe Escobar uh, to the top editorial position, which uh, makes him one of the, the top Latino news uh, uh, executives in the country. Uh, certainly at the LA Times, this is a very big issue though. Yeah, so. yeah we, we don't have a Latino masthead among the 14, uh, a Latino editor among the masthead, which is the kind of 14 people at the top of the organization. We've only had three Latino um, masthead editors, in fact, in our whole history. It's a giant, um, omit, it's a giant prob problem. Um, uh, we need to do better at it. Uh, it's, and it's not an excuse, but it is an explanation to say, that you know, the, this is about a pipeline. It's a really about career pipelines, and many of those pipelines have been severed or interrupted, or um, uh, by all the by, by all the economic challenges and the technological challenges uh, facing mainstream media. But but that again, that's not an excuse. We we've got to do better. I will say uh, briefly on that pipeline. This has been a big focus of ours at at the Klein College at Temple, and we we started an initiative a couple of years ago with the realization that. You know, and, and obviously there are many cultures within the Latino community, but um, in in very few, if any of those cultures is becoming a journalist, a, a real norm for college graduates. And obviously it, it's, it's both a business imperative and a normal and, and, a, and a moral imperative to develop those storytellers from those communities. So it's been a big uh, focus of outreach for us. Uh, Marsha, how about advice? Uh, not, not very good. Um, uh, we, like my colleague uh, uh, Sol, we have to do better. We have one Latinx woman who is our chief people officer, an extraordinary woman uh, who is uh, Dominican American. Um, and she came in less than four months ago. So um, lots of work. I would say that we are a bit better in our representation on camera, on Vice News. But when I do a mental scan of what was once our headquarters in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, um, I visually feel scant rep representation in our 
ranks, like in terms of editors, uh, in terms of uh, writers, producers, our on-air talent definitely better. I'm thinking one, two, three, four correspondents, three male, one woman, um, but that's not good enough. And it's definitely not good enough when we don't have Latinx representation uh, in senior management in terms of most particularly for me within our newsroom. Uh, but as I said, our new chief people officer is, is uh, on the hunt and she's not playing around. And one of the first things she did was she brought in a, a very well-respected, extraordinary uh, a Latino male to be on our DEI advisory board, which we'd never had uh, before. So that was, that's super important. But um, a, lot of, a lot of work, a lot of work needs to be done in this arena for sure. So um, since last March, most journalists have been working either from home or, or out on the streets, um, many times alone. Newsrooms are dark, abandoned places. And in some cases, especially where they're owned by hedge funds, they've been shut down entirely. Um, what has this physical separation meant for your news organizations, and I'm, I'm particularly interested in hearing, you know, both the negative and and maybe some potential positives, some things we've learned about about how we can uh, function in this sort of environment. And we'll we'll start with Sewell. Look, I think the clear negatives are the lack of people to people contact, the ability to look someone in the eye, which I think is very important for empathy and for trust building, um, the ability to kind of you know put a hand on a shoulder, um, give someone a hug. All the, I, I think interpersonal you know, matters a lot. And that's been very, very sad that we haven't been able to do that. Um, a lot of our employees are suffering from great stress and anxiety, and we have to really do a lot to address that. I mean, this is probably the most momentous year in American history, at least since 1968. Uh, and you know, there's, there's real, I think, trauma coming from you know, just the, and, and just exhaustion, frankly, from these events. There are some plus sides. I think we were moving toward a more, um, kind of distributed newsroom anyway, in terms of people, you know, LA is a famously a very fragmented region. People live, we're commuting from very vast distances. I think it has improved our Slack culture. You know, people recognizing that, you know, getting the work done um, synchronously um, is more important than necessarily, sometimes it's more uh, important than, there are alternatives I'm saying to face-to-face -face communication. And I think it's probably accelerated some of the digital transition that needed to occur here. Um, I also think it's, um, you know, people are taking, I think, an extra step to like really think about the, the well-being of our journalists. I would say one of the main changes from kind of COVID and, and the traumas of this year is that we have to focus on journalists' well-being and health. PTSD is a real thing. Trauma is a real thing. I really like have relied so much on the DART Center and other organizations that are working on journalism and trauma to really help us um, get through this because we know it's not going to end soon. Uh, we're, we're not coming back as a newsroom until June at the soonest. And, and are there specific things that you've done around caring for journalists? Well, we've made sure that everyone gets regular check-ins um, uh, from their manager. I mean, that's the most obvious. Um, we've also had, um, they're like kind of um, uh, obviously reminding employees of the employee assistance program, but there've also been, I think, some spontaneous networks of people who've, you know, risen up to share, you know, experiences. Everything for, as mundane as, you know, your ergonomic setup and working from home to the more profound questions about, you know, building journalistic community. And we've onboarded new employees, some of whom have never, you know, worked in a newsroom. So it's, it's just a fascinating, other, others have retired on the other end of the career um, uh, spectrum. So it is a fascinating time. And I don't think we'll know all the answers until, you know, until at least, uh, until at least next year. So how about you, Marsha? How has the, this physical separation impacted you guys? Um, I think in uh, many of the, the same ways as Sewell uh, just described, I think that uh, there is a question that I was going to bring up. I think that, uh, you know, remote learning and remote work uh, was something that we should have all been better prepared for, full stop, to begin with, before it, it was forced upon us. Um, I think that we're going to learn a lot from this, uh, but I think that um, it will change newsrooms uh, forever. Um, I think that we too are not coming back until June. Uh, 
Uh, and who knows, with this next wave that we seemingly are in, will that keep pushing it back further and further? Uh, we're in a vast building in Williamsburg, Brooklyn as our headquarters. And it's like, I say this with uh, knowledge and, a, and some little bit of affection having lived in uh, Asia, it was like a giant factory where you just had rows and rows and rows of young people with headsets in front of their laptops or walking around getting their coffee and hanging out in the lobby, that's done. Uh, and how we rebuild that in some way that allows for health and safety. So we've learned a lot. Um, you know, there was a moment, what was it, um, 10, 15, 20 years ago when anthrax was delivered in the mail and we had to learn how to kind of deal with those small little things. Then suddenly we have something like COVID and there's no, so you'll know this, it's like you have earthquake preparedness. So you're ready for an earthquake, but no one thought about that kind of preparedness when thinking about an office with a pandemic. So now we're creating protocols that we should have always in some way uh, been ready to um, uh, implement. Uh, but what I think we are missing is that one-on-one -on -one contact or that um, Monday morning family meeting, news meeting where everyone's at the table or in the room and you have that camaraderie, you have that collaborative process, you have those moments where it really is ideation because you're sitting across from someone and you're bouncing around the stories of the day and having that philosophical debate first thing in the morning around what are going, what will our stories be for tonight's show. So I think we lose a great deal by not having that ability to be in that room together. This is great, but it is isolating and frankly, very lonely. And I'm about to have lunch after this talk with a friend who is uh, uh, an EVP in the news division, Susie Banacarium, who I've not seen since March when we walked out of the building together. And I, all I wanna do is hug her. And I know we're gonna to have to do this annoying elbow thing. So um, I, I think it's presented a, a set of challenges for us that I think on an emotional level, we'll be dealing with for a very long time. And yes, trauma and PTSD is real for our journalists, especially our journalists of color who have gone out uh, and have been reporting. And especially during the summer, there was a lot of check-ins and let's get you into therapy ASAP and have you start talking to folks because it was traumatic for many of uh, many on our staff. Thank you. Um, the other sort of trauma that, that journalists have been through you know, over the past four years, this labeling by the president of journalists as, as the enemy of the people, um, and we heard earlier these these stark figures on how a large portion of the country, particularly Republicans, have, have really next to zero trust in what they call the, the lamestream media. Do mainstream media outlets have any chance of recovering these people and, and should we even try? Marcia? No. <laughs> uh, I I think, I mean I would I don't think Vice is mainstream. We're on a cable channel that I'm still trying to get people to figure out how they can get it. But if we put up all of our work the next morning online, which is probably not good for the ability of broadcasts and cable to survive. But if we want people to see our work, we have to put it up on digital, full stop, or else it just disappears into the ether. So um, your question was, I mean, it, it's, it's mostly around this matter of enemy of the people, trust, and, and even I want you to think beyond Vice as well as a longtime yeah. you know, mainstream network. Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're hosed. Um, I think simply said, I, you look at the numbers of my former network, CBS News, which was once the most trusted network in America, where we had close to, I don't know, 28 million people her night in the heyday of Walter and Dan and men with the voice of God kind of uh, moniker. And they're down to a couple of million each night. And uh, that does not bode well. I mean, I used to be able to say, but during time of crisis, people come back. This election proved that, but this has just been such an extraordinary year and an extraordinary 
uh, election that I don't think we'll be able to re regroup. And you can already see, and the thing that really scares me is that literally when I just think about broadcasts, not print, but when you look at the three major networks or four or five networks, literally after the election, instead of keeping after all of the stuff that we're supposed to be tracking from COVID to our democracy, I started to see the subtle kind of infusion of those light and fluffy stories like Joe and Jill's love affair. Like, I don't care about that. I don't want to know about that. I want to make sure that we're keeping those stories front and center. And that, I think, for people who might have come back during this cycle, and then they see that kind of reporting in a 22-minute broadcast when you take out for commercials, that does not help uh, us engage and engender trust. So I totally agree with Marsha that we need to, like, um, we need to avoid unforced um, unforced errors and own goals. We need to do a lot of introspection because I think the threat isn't just from the kind of right wing populist slash authoritarian attacks on freedom of the press that are going around worldwide. I mean, that it's a hugely worrisome phenomenon. Um, and I think the attempt to portray the press as part of the opposition, um, as opposed to, you know, a pillar of our democracy is really, really troubling. I think we're gonna need a lot more civic education, a lot more media literacy. Um, I don't think there's a single solution. Um, I think the platforms, which we haven't talked that much about at this conference, have a lot of responsibility as well. Let's face it, Facebook has not weighted CBS News or, um, or, Vice, or, or Vice or the LA Times for that matter. Um, you know, it has given Breitbart kind of not only equal airtime, if you will, but, but actually changed the standard as we learned for Breitbart to try to, you know, talk about false equivalency. And I think there needs to be a way to reward fact-based accountability journalism that's verifiable, to reward organizations that have a standards policy, standards and practices, to reward organizations that have an ombudsperson, to reward organizations that publish corrections and publish letters to the editor. And, you know, reward accountability. I'm not saying choose winners and losers, but re reward organizations that hold themselves accountable or try to. And I think the platforms haven't done a good enough job doing that. But I also, to get back, to tie it back to the earlier part of the conversation, it's not just coming from, from right wing. You know, a lot of audiences that are younger or more liberal or more diverse really see that, that mainstream media has failed them in some ways. So this is really a profound moment where I think we're feeling the pressure from all sides. And, and, you know, we've got to, pay, we've, we've got to be mindful of that. Uh, in my mind, the most profound uh, crisis uh, facing our country, um, and, and I think COVID particularly laid it uh, just in the starkest relief, is, the, is wealth inequality. And how, how are we as journalists uh, doing on that topic and how can we do better on it? You know, I don't, um, I don't think we're doing a great job uh, on this topic. I think that, you know, I know you want me to think broadly uh, and not just, you know, talk about the great work that Vice is doing. Um, I think we've done a pretty poor job overall in explaining this gaping chasm law between the very, very rich and, and the very poor and the impact that has uh, in every aspect of our lives. I don't, I don't see enough reporting around that, but I think that an unintended consequence of COVID has been we're being forced now because of the recession that COVID has created and we are seeing more stories around wealth inequality because of what COVID has done to our economy and that people are losing jobs. But I still feel like there's just a skimming of the surface of the depths of poverty that people are experiencing that we are not putting a bright enough light upon for sure. I think that there's just a lost generation of people that you can see in, in major cities because you're, you're, if you're out, you're seeing a different kind of homelessness, which in a city like for me in New York, it has changed. I mean, it feels like the 80s in certain parts of New York. Um, and you've got a, a whole different quality of, of, of homelessness that I've never seen before. 
Um, so I don't want this to be a chorus of we have to do better, but we we have to do better. We have to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. So we have yeah, to. But I'll add one thought. I think I totally agree with Marsha and actually I share your perception here in Los Angeles with respect to the homelessness. I chose to live in downtown LA and it, you know, it really amplifies a lot of the inequalities. I would say inequality like climate change are probably the most important stories of our time. Mm -hmm. And I think the challenge is that as journalists, we think about the word journal, think about the, the, the origin of the word jour, day, we think about the daily and the momentary. But for both inequality and for climate change, there are structural and historical things going on. And then we have to think deep into the future about the implications for our democracy and for our planet. That's hard when you're moving, when you're moving fast. And I think that's one reason why explanatory journalism, like 1619 Project, which helps to contextualize how we got to a place where African-American families have one-tenth the uh, household wealth of white families, right? Because it's not just income. And I think a lot of folks had focused on income and wage inequality, which are themselves significant issues, very significant um, in terms of outside discrimination. But there's also this whole thing about assets that we're all learning about as well, community assets, household assets. So it's hard. I think we need more explanatory journalism. We need more investigative. We also need editors, though, who are going to keep prioritizing these themes because, look, I'm not sure if calling it a climate emergency like The Guardian is doing, I'm not sure if that flips a switch and helps immediately, but we do need to treat these as long running emergencies. Um, um, you know, and, and I think that's hard for, for us as daily journalists to not get distracted by the bright shiny thing or the Joe and Jill love story. Right, okay, one last, and, and this I want a quick, maybe 30 second answer, but one thing that makes you uh, feel optimistic about 2021 when it comes to journalism. One, I wanna leave people with, uh, with some hope here for, so 2021 is not the WTF year for journalism. So, I mean, this is a trite answer, but I think that a return to a more normal government um, is going to help in some ways. And not just the obvious ways. I'm not trying to make this a partisan statement, but I believe that one of the things that happened was that Trump sucked the oxygen out of the room and made kind of rational thought more difficult, made civil debate more difficult, and frankly, exacerbated the inequality going on within journalism. All the attention shifted to Washington. Mm -hmm. So you saw a lot of benefits for brands like the New York Times, the Washington Post, I'm a proud alum, but you also saw, I think, a lot of suffering for regional, local news organizations, including the ones that have risen up in the last few years. Um, state and local is where the decisions often get made that affect people's lives. And I'm hoping that 2021 will bring, will bring about a rebalancing of the journalism ecosystem. That's a great answer. Marsha? Yeah. Wow. That I don't know if I... Uh, <laughs> match that I will echo and say, absolutely, totally agree. And for, for me in my role, and uh, Dean Boardman knows what I'll say here next, is the, the chutzpah and the uh, kind of passion that has not been lost by recent college graduates and or those who've been in the business for just a few years. We met them in the newsroom over the summer if we didn't know them. And I have to say that that passion and that desire to be truth tellers uh, in many ways is real. And I love the fact that my company has been in the business of hiring the non-traditional journalists of taking, um, you know, an Alexis Johnson, who is a Temple graduate, who I brought into Vice, uh, and it was on the air in, in less than a few weeks, reporting live, and she'd only done a smidge of, of television reporting, but she was a writer at the Pittsburgh Gazette and she took on the establishment when they took her off of her writing beat and she filed a lawsuit against them. And that's the, that's the kind of like, you know, um, chutzpah that I think we need uh, from uh, our young journalists. And I don't see them turning away. I think they're, they're coming to grips with the fact that their voices are needed more now than ever before. And I think that our kind of recognition, I know you said this is 30 seconds, but last thought of how we define who a journalist is and where they report from and on what platform. But if they're out there and they're in their communities and they're providing information, I think that that is a really good thing. And I don't see that tapering off. I feel 
that there are more and more, when I look at the number of applications that come into Vice, that there's, there's still a, a desire to be a journalist in this country. I think it's recognized. So keep up the good work, Dean. All right, well, on that note, thank you. Great session. Thanks, thanks for your thoughts. Back to Chris. Appreciate it, guys. Um, we we uh, have your break now. We'll be back at 1 p.m. Stretch the legs, hydrate. Uh, we'll be back again uh, with earned income and news organizations. Margaret Sullivan from the Washington Post. Ken Doctor, uh, his look at local, is launching uh, just the next week. And Liza Gross at the Solutions Journalism Network. So take a break. We'll be back in, in a few minutes at 1 p.m. Eastern. Thanks, everybody.